Roxy Mason spends her retirement quilting at home in Sacramento. It's like putting a puzzle together. She's been quilting for 10 years. I just find it challenging, also relaxing. Stitched with love, Roxy makes quilts for her family. Grandchildren and brothers and sisters, great nieces and nephews, and at least in my family, that uh, as far as quilting and the culture of growing up around quilts, it would have been more for uh, comfort. The International Quilt Museum says quilting has a rich and diverse history from the ancient to the modern world. And the first evidence that we know of quilting is actually found in e an Egyptian tomb. So the idea of quilting and its patterning is really ubiquitous throughout the world and throughout time. Some quilters and scholars say enslaved African Americans may have used coated quilts to navigate the Underground Railroad, but the museum says there's no evidence of that happening. Within a family, within a culture, could they have created quilts and used them to portray a message? That is something we've seen through quilting always throughout quilting. So I do think that these messages are often found in quilts. And what that message is, is unique to the individual. I s stitched down all kinds of African fabrics. Yvonne Warren uses quilts to promote black culture. Everybody should learn about everyone's culture. She owns Jewels and Fiber Art Studio in Sacramento and mostly makes art to wear. I make garments. Um, that have a lot of quilting techniques in them, and some of my purses as well. I like crazy quilts and a lot of um, stitching that goes on the top to give it some surface design and texture. For Yvonne, quilting is an outlet for creative expression. So I use my own techniques when it comes to making a piece, and it may go, I don't, I don't know if it'll go on a bed or be a wrap, but it'll be a piece of art somewhere. Oh. Oh. Wow. The Sisters Quilting Collective in Sacramento encourages African American artists and others to share their love for quilting. Sonia Lopes joined the group from the start in 2012. My family became biracial and I wanted to learn more about African art and culture and if we learn, maybe we can learn to do better. The group meets each month to talk about fiber arts and ways to give back to the community. Well, we do a lot of quilts for um, underprivileged children. We make fleece hats and scarves and give them away during the winter. With the use of fabric, thread, and needles, quilters tell stories that represent black people, history, and culture for all to celebrate. We have some famous quilters, Faith Ringgold, and, and the, you know, there's a tremendous list uh, of women uh, and men who um, create and tell stories. And people who no, wouldn't or, ordinarily find that information in a book may find it expressed in a quilt. Hello, beautiful people. My name is Ajua Achianu. I'm a Ghanaian-American woman from Sacramento, California. I'm a professional speaker and the CEO of She Has she. I think from a young age, I really remember having really huge parties. There's this association called GAS, the Ghanaian Association of Sacramento. And I grew up performing in like their cultural performances and just dancing. And I remember just feeling so alive and so connected to everyone in that room, even the folks that I didn't know, so connected by our food, by language. Hello, my name is Ezekiel Conte. I go by Zeke. My African heritage is from Sierra Leone, West Africa. That's where my parents are from. Raised in North Carolina, moved to California about 16 years ago, and I now reside in Sacramento, California. Being black means being resilient to me, not giving up, having that toughness, having that tough skin to be able to wake up every day and go out there and say to yourself, I can do this, and think about everything my ancestors have done for us, like the sacrifice and the freedom that we're enjoying right now that we may not think about every day because we sometimes we just wake up and not realizing how good we have it and, uh, and we're still fighting to, uh, to be better and that's all we can do and just keep fighting, keep fighting to be better.
It's a hidden gem in South Sacramento. The Sojourner Truth African Heritage Museum sits in the corner of the Florence Square Shopping Center. It's just been so amazing to be able to do this work. Shona McDaniels founded the museum in 1996. Her mission is to change lives through art education. What's special to me is being able to uh, work with youth that are choosing the path of being an artist. Put the glue on here. The museum holds events like this one to inspire the youth, strengthen families, and bring communities together. Okay, that's Henry Box Brown. And then there's Massa Musa. He was a great African king. She says it's also about ensuring representation in the arts. Because I want young black girls, you know, to, when they see my art, be proud to be a black woman. This piece was inspired by my mother and uh, my mother's mother. Shona fell in love with art at a young age and remains inspired by the story of Sojourner Truth. As a young lady, I used to uh, draw images of Sojourner Truth. Born into slavery, Sojourner Truth tirelessly advocated for the rights of African Americans and women. I want to do something special to honor her legacy. And she did with the creation of the Sojo Museum. It explores the black experience, past and present. The walls of the museum are covered with African-American art, from paintings to photography, quilts, and more. Everything that I share on the canvas is coming from my perspective as a black woman. Shona has contributed to more than 150 murals in Sacramento, Stockton, and San Francisco. It means everything uh, uh, to me because often, you know, black artists are overlooked. There's also been times when I wanted to show my work at galleries in the downtown area. I was told I couldn't show my work because I had these melanated images of black women. So that's what my hope is for more of these powerful images of black people to be in public view. With the museum, Shona is creating space for black artists of all ages to thrive. Being able to celebrate uh, black artists is just an amazing thing and is long overdue. Hi, my name is Jesse Williams. I'm also known as Little Boy Blue. I am a recording artist, entertainer, musician, and as well as a UC Davis student. I am the son of a Samoan and Filipino dad and an African-American mother, and I grew up in Oakland, California, and spent a little time in Sacramento, as well as Hilo, Hawaii. Black culture means so much to me. Um, in recent news, there's a lot of uh, misconceptions and a lot of uh, questionable things that people see in the media today. So as my job as an entertainer and also an advocate and educator, it's my job to showcase and highlight the many positive things that are done in the black community. My name is Karen Johnson. I am the reigning Mrs. California American 2022. I have taught in the Sacramento area for over 30 years. I am also a singer and songwriter of contemporary Christian music. Holding the title of Mrs. California really meant a lot to me and I think to others as well um, because they see a woman of color has kind of broken through a barrier where not as many minorities have held that, that space um, or that title. Maisha Bahati, CEO of Crystal Nugs. We are a storefront dispensary and delivery. Hi, I'm Rhonda Ernest, and I am the CEO and founder of Natural High. My name is Adiola Adedipe. I am the CEO and founder of Aiden's Relief. So I'm Zion, and I'm the CEO and the founder of Shashamani Institute, which is an alternative holistic medicine. These four black women have fought hard to be where they are today as successful cannabis business owners. They've formed a strong bond, and they all credit it to the 
City's Cannabis Opportunity Reinvestment and Equity, or CORE, program. And the intent of the program is to help reduce barriers of entry into the cannabis industry for those who were most impacted by the war on drugs and the communities that were most impacted by disparate policing of cannabis-related offenses. Davina Smith, the City's Cannabis Program Manager, says the cannabis industry is primarily run by white men. The CORE program awards funds to retailers to help open their cannabis businesses, but the journey hasn't always been easy. Talk to me about what challenges you guys face and how you worked with one another to empower one another. We're a very small minority here in Sacramento as black women in cannabis. And sometimes you need help, sometimes you need advice, sometimes you need, you know, how do you do this, how do you do that? And just to have a little bit of that is so essential. Maisha Bahati is the first black woman to own a dispensary in the city of Sacramento. She started her business as a delivery service in 2018. Adiola Adedipe got into cannabis when her son was diagnosed with leukemia. She believes it was cannabis and chemo that healed her son. I'm advocating for parents with catastrophically ill children and so that's a whole nother demographic. Um, in the Sacramento area, we have well over 30,000 families that are using cannabis openly for their children for autism and cancer and MS or anxiety. And so um, just getting into that space alone was trying to figure out how could I represent black women? I'm educated, I'm a great speaker, um, how can I help the community? And I think when we all sit at this table, the secret sauce to all of our businesses is that we're here to stand up and help the community and show them to each one to teach one until you reach one. While these women credit the CORE program for helping them, they recognize it isn't perfect. Rhonda Ernest opened up her online cannabis business in April 2022 after owning a salon for more than 30 years. She says they need more than just funding. When you pick these 10 people, the funds should be attached to that. Because you're saying to her, yeah, you are marginalized. Yeah, you are affected by the war on drugs. We're going to give you this opportunity. But the reason why you're saying it is because <laughs> she's been disenfranchised. With black women business owners within this space, what, what challenges have you seen them endure? Trying to get in there with the historic racism, right? With the lack of access to generational wealth. And then just the family commitments, too. I mean, we talk all the time about, you know, I mean, just offhand about all the commitments that you have for family, you know, parents, children, relatives, you're trying to take care of businesses. The current owner of Ethiopian restaurant Queen Sheba, Zion Tedese, launched her medical cannabis company more than two years ago to help people with medical conditions like cancer and PTSD. What they put as far as equity money into us is practically pity, especially when they're giving funds to the to different departments. The core program first gave these women a $75,000 loan that they're still paying back to this day. These women say then they were awarded $133,000 broken up into two payments. To date, the city says 42 businesses have been permitted through the core program with an additional 16 in the application process. This feedback about the core program is nothing new, but noted. If you get somebody permitted and, and operational, but then they have to close six months later because they haven't able to get adequate business, they're, they're too much in debt, they've got these issues, then that's not success. That's not what success for the core program and for our entrepreneurs looks like. So we really had to kind of think and, and work a lot, you know, work with the core community about for where you are in your journey, what do you need? Like what can best assist you? Other barriers black women cannabis business owners say they face is one, lack of resources, support, and two, high taxes. These women say they're taxed 27.5% with minimal write-offs. What vision do you guys have for future black women within this space? I think we have a platform now to change all that. We're not gonna be listening to the city and the state, and instead we will be coming together to advocate what is due for us to build our community. We as black women, we as black people in this industry, we have the ability to give opportunities to those who other, otherwise would not have them. You're giving people an opportunity because they feel comfortable with you and you grow and you grow. I, I, I cannot go back to a nine to five. So um, I see myself continuously to have this freedom to be able to create and live a life and help people um, and then see the vision of you know, agents relief on everything and um, continue to have that piece of helping people and building teams and stuff. So for me, it's the sky's the limit. We gave them hope that you can get in here. Yes. You might have to kick the door in, but hey, you know, <laughs> yeah. Rhonda did it, I can do it. It takes a lot of work. I'm not gonna act like it don't, but it, you, you can do it.
Hi, I'm Les Simmons, senior pastor of South Sacramento Christian Center. You know, I'm a third generation pastor on both sides of my family. My dad was a pastor and is a bishop, my mom as well too. And they come from a deep heritage of, uh, within the civil rights movement and community engagement. What it means to be black to me is to know that I have a story, a story of resilience, a story of struggle, a story of strength, a story of community. Hey, I'm Lonnie Horn, uh, owner of World Class Faders Barbershop, also part owner of uh, the United Barbers Club. I was actually born in Chicago, Illinois, and uh, Sacramento has become home away from home since the age of 13. I wasn't raised by a very pro-black family, so uh, I really did not know the importance of it uh, until I would say maybe the last five to 10 years, um, just hearing how, um, how influential uh, black owners and businesses could be to our community. Uh, if you're ever in the area, you're ever in Oak Park, over in uh, near World Class Faders, Fix and Soul Kitchen, Underground Books, any of these wonderful businesses that surround us. Uh, I have a whole list I could keep on listing. I definitely invite people to come in and uh, just say hi. This is Hanita Aliou, and she's living her dream of sharing her culture through food. Nestled in a quiet corner of a shopping center off Fulton Avenue in Arden Arcade, you will find her restaurant. And it's called Abyssinia, it means Ethiopia. Hanita Aliou, the owner of Abyssinia Ethiopian Restaurant, works alongside her husband and her mother, Nigatwa Waldesi. Nigatwa runs the kitchen and prepares traditional Ethiopian cuisine. That includes the freshly made inhara bread eaten with every meal. I grew up eating the food and cooking it with my mom. So I was like, oh, why not open up a restaurant? That wasn't always the plan. Her initial goal was to open a daycare after studying child and adolescent development at Sacramento State. When the original owner of the restaurant decided to retire, Aliou stepped in. Ethiopian traditions not only influence the food, but how it's served as well. With the food, everybody eats together, so it's like family style. So you don't have your own plate. So when, when it's served, it will be like on a big plate and then everybody will sit around and share. So we have like for older people, like for the younger people. So you just dig in. So you just go in there, just get some of the meat, okay. meat and spiced butter. To stay authentic, Abyssinia only uses spices and coffee imported from Ethiopia. This is what we use for most of like, our spicy dishes. The spice is just as colorful as the varieties of foods served at the restaurant. The most popular food here is like the Grand Sampler. It's a different variety of veggies and meat dishes. There is some spice to it. There's mild dishes. There are some vegetarian dishes. This Black History Month, she's taking pride in her culture and her country. She says it means a great deal to have a month representing the black community. Because I will show like different cultures and then different like restaurants, let's say, different places that are black owned that you can go and see or shop or eat at. So it's important because you don't get to see that throughout the year a lot. And although it may have been nerve wracking in the beginning to start a business, Aliou says taking the risk has paid off. Before this, I used to think like people wouldn't enjoy our food, but come like starting this and seeing people like enjoying it and then they come in and they're like, oh, we love this food. And it's like, it's so satisfying because they're like sharing what I'm feeling. Coffee, which originated in Ethiopia, also plays a big role in Aliou's culture. Abyssinia offers a traditional coffee ceremony in which a host will first roast the coffee beans by hand. Incense is burned as the coffee brews. And then a younger person will pour the coffee 
starting with the eldest and then everyone sitting in a circle socializing. Aliou says it's a different scene than what most people picture when they think of Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a beautiful country, um, never been colonized, so we kept our tradition, our food, it's like it's the same food that been cooked for years. This is called shuro wet. In honor of Black History Month, she invites people to step out of their comfort zone and keep an open mind when it comes to trying new foods. Okay. Oh, that's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want them like to leave happy because it's a wonderful food. Like I have a lot of customers, they come in for first time and they enjoy it because it's very flavorful. So when the customer leave, I will love them to be like, oh, I remember that place. Like it's the best food, you know, the best culture. What's going on everybody? My name is Melissa Muganza Murphy. My pronouns are she, they, and sis. I am the CEO of Muganza Entertainment and CEO and founder of Mindy's Kitchen. And I am a proud black, West Indian, Kenyan, queer woman. Black folks are everywhere. We're in every country, every continent, every city. We have influenced so much of the culture from scientific evolution to medical engineering, to personal style, to language, to popular culture, to entertainment. Celebrating this month is not only just for black folks, it's for all of us because we're all impacted by the beautiful intelligence that black people bring. Greetings everyone, my name is Michelle Martin Neal, I'm a Sacramento native. I was born and raised here and I love Sacramento, I love people. I love encouraging people and like, like getting the word out. My parents is the reason why I'm successful. I'm saying successful as far as I'm optimistic, I'm a grandmother, I have a lovely daughter, I have four grandchildren, and I'm blessed. I count my blessings each and every day. My mother's 88 years old and she's my mentor and she keeps me on the right path and I can make it. Black people, we're powerful. We love each other, we have all different skin tones, and it's just a blessing to be black. Hello, I'm Gunnery Sergeant Stanton Beal from West Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I am a retired Gunnery Sergeant the United States Marine Corps. I am the only black Marine in the entire history of the Marine Corps to have an Antarctica Expeditionary Medal. And in combat, I have 23 combat air medals and, you know, other awards. So I've been around. I was born in the 30s, raised in the 40s, struggled in the 50s. And nowadays, I've seen a little bit of it all. To be black, you know what I mean, is to be proud and to strive for equality and don't take no for an answer. She may be just 10 years old, but her lyrics and her beats are gaining traction on YouTube and winning awards. Boss Tootie, you did that thing, Boss Tootie. This is Boss Tootie, and she's Sacramento's newest rising music artist. I am big, strong, independent woman. Boss Tootie, AKA Tia Olani Young, is in fourth grade, and she raps about a lot of things you would think a 10-year-old should rap about. Very nice dream. Magical. A whole world filled with ice cream. But one of her latest songs is a little different. She's rapping about her diverse upbringing. It was inspired by my culture. I'm half black and half monk. As she gets older, Boss Tootie is realizing the importance of embracing and sharing her experience of growing up in a biracial family. Because she is biracial, so she, she needs to be a reflection of that. I am very biracial. In, in her music and everything. <laughs> Boss Tootie gets a lot of personality from her mom, but her skills in rapping come from her father, Ren Z, who is a rapper himself and a producer. This is going to create an opportunity for Hmong people to approach her, and it's going to have, you know, in a, in a sense, force her to learn more Hmong to be able to have to engage with her other side. Boss Tootie and her dad collaborate on all of her songs. She says, lyrically, her inspiration comes from the upbringing and how she sees her parents as individuals. The crazy part is they're both blind, my dad and my mom. Growing up with biracial and vision impaired parents, Boss Tootie has gained a unique perspective on life. She's been raised to see the positives in people, 
no matter who they are. And that shows up in her music. And I think everybody has some form of a disability, or some, you know, some form. But I believe when you start up as this quote unquote person with a non-disability and you go through something, it humbles you. And your story, it, it does something to your mind. Boss Tootie's about to drop her next music video, Sleep All Day, sometime next month. It's about resting and taking care of yourself after working hard. And working hard for your dreams is something that Boss Tootie believes in. It's for a snow note. Never give up on your dreams and you should keep going no matter who puts you down and what puts you down. Words to live by, Boss Tootie. In Sacramento, I'm John Bartell.